Hello, and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is our first episode of our History 150 special class, the History of Modern East Asia, where we go from roughly 1500 to 2000 and more. Uh, that said, we're going to start with the Mongols. So we start earlier, way earlier than 1500, because we have to talk about the effects that lead into the 1500s. And so when we talk about the Mongols, we are talking about the largest land empire ever created, the largest contiguous land empire. The Mongols are going to set off in 1206 and conquer, well, the entire steppe, basically. All the Middle East, a large part of Asia, they are one of the great conqueror, destroyers, horsemen of the apocalypse the world created. So we have to talk about how and why and then what the effects are. And that will be our, our second episode. Um, so we start with Temujin, Genghis Khan, who by 1206 had united the horse tribes the Mongolian, Turkish-speaking horse tribes on the edge of China, on the uh, northwestern edge of China. <sighs> if you took my History 101 course, you know that China has a very long history dealing with the nomadic horse peoples of the West. They are constantly being invaded. They're invaded so much that Early dynasties, early imperial dynasties, built what would become the Great Wall later on to try to keep them out. It never works. The, the, the walls just never work. You go around them. You can go over them. Mostly you just go through them by bribing the guards. So there is a very long history of nomadic horse peoples on the edge of China being a trouble for China, invading China, wrecking cities, doing bad things. And Temujin is going to be one of those guys. How do they lead? Well, the Khans have great charisma. They lead through personal loyalty. This is a nomadic uh, method of leadership. You, there, you know, it's Khaleesi, it's Drogo, it is. There's not a lot of structure. You lead by example. You lead by personality. You have access to the leader, and you follow the Khan. You follow Genghis Khan or Temujin because you want to. So in this way, it's very democratic. Um, nomadic horse tribes are actually pretty communist. They share everything because they live on such the edge of existence that you have to share everything. They hunt together. They share the hunt together. They share all of the work, women work, women hunt. Um, and so the leader of this tribe has to be a tough person capable of not just saying, I'm the leader, but capable of getting people to follow them. So great charisma and personal loyalty. And Genghis Khan and the Mongols are going to build the finest nomadic horse army the world will see. And they have cow. It's going to be based on cavalry, people on horses. This is what they're good at. And they're going to have a combination of archers. You know, this is the, the what the horse people are good at, traditionally good at. They uh, it's it's hunting. This is Luke Skywalker in uh, A New Hope, by the way, where he talks about where they're, they're in the scene and they talk about attacking the Death Star. And they're like, oh, this exhaust port is only two meters wide. And the guy's like, oh, my God, you can't even possibly hit that. And Luke Skywalker's like, I got hit a womp rat on my my star speeder. Like, easy. That's nothing. And that's exactly how the Mongols felt. 
they could hit something with their bow going 20, 25 miles an hour. That was the size of a rabbit. They could hit that. And so a person standing six feet tall, five foot five to six feet tall, is easy to shoot. Um, they also created lancers. This is less typical of the nomads. And so it shows they're adapting because the, they're going to create lancers. They're going to big spear. And this is really for use for stabbing animals. You see this on, um, on um, Spanish bullfights. But it's really for stabbing people because what people do is they they don't like getting shot with arrows from far away. And so what they do is they have shields and they put their shields up and they hide behind the shields and they put the shields together and they stand shoulder to shoulder and they make a box like a phalanx. And all of a sudden, all your arrows won't do anything. Congratulations. And so what you need to do is break them apart or more importantly, not let them clump up together in the first place. And that's where the lancers come in. You come in and you stab someone else's horse people or you stab infantry before they clump up, put their shields together. Because once they do that, then you're just riding around and trying to wear them down um, while they wait for you to run out of arrows, basically. Um, this happened to Crassus's army in Syria. So that's what he, they, the Parthians didn't run out of arrows, eventually wore down the Roman army and obliterated it. Two, the Mongols have excellent discipline. They are, for all intents and purposes, a modern army in the medieval world. For all the talk about medieval knights and the such, or Japanese samurai, though they were individual warriors. They're not very good at taking orders. A medieval commander would basically show up at the battlefield and say, stand or charge. And then chaos would ensue. Take a look at the movie Braveheart. It's basically go forward. He is in the fight. Mel Gibson is in the fight. He can't command anybody. He can't move troops. The Mongols could. Genghis Khan could. The generals have a command of their troops in battle. Discipline. These men listened to their generals. They fought together. They fought in units as small as 10. And as large as, I want to say, 10,000, which would be a modern division. Um, so using flags, communication, riders, a general could command the battlefield, his troops, the Mongolian troops on the battlefield in a way nobody else could. And so you see the Mongols do this again and again and again. They stay, go and they charge, they retreat, they suck people in, they all of a sudden they spread out on the wings and they just surround and they crush people. While medieval armies are constantly looking for individual success, the Mongols fought together for each other, and it brought them success against superior armies in Europe, in China, and in the Middle East. Three, they knew they didn't know what they didn't know, and so they hired natives Native engineers to help them, especially with siege craft. Nomadic horse people do not know how to lay siege to a city. Walls, if you take my History 101 course, you know, are specifically built to keep out nomadic people. You build up a wall, you build up a 30-foot wall, and you build a 15-foot wall, but you build a 30-foot wall, and the nomads show up, and you hide behind it, and the nomads ride around, and they steal, they might kill some people, they'll steal some women, they'll steal some kids, they steal animals, you know, they'll steal some food, that's really what they're there for. And then they leave. They don't cause all that much destruction to a city. Because the walls keep them out. Horses don't climb walls, and no nomad would get off his horse. That's where his advantage is. He's eight feet up in the air, 
He's moving, so his bow has more power. His lance has more power. So you don't get off the horse. And so basically it becomes a Monty Python sketch where the nomads ride around and the people in the in the walls go <laughs> flicking their, putting their thumb on their nose and go ah, and waiting for them to go away. Well, what the Mongols realize is they know this. And so they hired, especially Chinese. They hired Chinese engineers to help them destroy Chinese cities. Now it helped especially in northern China, that northern China was dominated by another barbarian horse people, the Jin, also known as the Yurchen, J-U-R-C-H-E-N. And we'll talk about this a little bit. And so the Mongols show up and they say, hey, we'll pay you lots of money if you help us destroy these cities. Well, the Chinese engineers are like, yeah, give us the money. But they're also like, you know, this doesn't really hurt Chinese people too much. I mean, you know, it'll, it'll hurt the, the, the Jin. Now, it hurt Chinese people a lot. But you could, you could take that step that what you're doing is bringing down a foreign... You're helping a foreign barbarian to destroy another foreign barbarian. And so Chinese engineers, and the Chinese engineers will follow the Mongols. They will bring them and their gunpowder and their tools and their expertise and their metallurgy. And they'll go to the Middle East and they'll go to Russia and they will go west. The big thing that they used was terrorism. The Mongols, like the Huns before them, like most nomadic horse peoples, used what we would call state-sponsored terrorism. They kill everything and everyone. And we settled people, civilized people, people who call themselves civilized, go, oh my God, this is terrible, this is barbaric. But not to nomads. To nomads, this was how war was fought. War was fought against competitors for food. You needed food. When you ran into other people, you were competing with them for food. If they ate your food, you starved. So the best way of gaining food is to murder the people. Now you murder the men because they're useless because men are fairly useless. Like once you have one man, you don't need more men. You kidnap the women and you absorb them into your tribe because women died at a substantial rate, a stunning rate from disease from childbirth, from just giving childbirth. Nobody knows anything about giving birth. The best that you get is a woman who has given birth before, maybe a couple of times and has survived it. But if a baby's feet come out first or the butt comes out first, that child may die and the mother is probably going to die as well. Uh, even if you have a successful childbirth, uh, you had what the British will later call childbed fever, everything's in the dirt. There's no knowledge about germs. There's no knowledge about infections. And so what you end up with is you give birth in the dirt. Everything's fine. And then three days later, you got a fever. And what you basically have is sepsis. You get an infection. It gets into your blood. It goes right through everything and just burns you out. And so there's a constant need for more women. You also enslave, kidnap the children. And the reason why is fairly easy. You kidnap the children because... They're going to do the work that no man wants to do. Watering the horses, cleaning the horses, taking the horses out to feed, doing, doing little jobs that the men warriors don't want to do. So it frees them up. It frees them up to hunt. It frees them up for politics. It frees them up for things. And those children, like those women, will be incorporated in. Those children will eventually marry into the tribe and will become members of the tribe. Those women will be married off to a man who has lost a wife and will become a wife and thus a citizen. Now, are we talking about rape? Yes. By any modern definition, what we're talking about is rape. She is having sex with a man who she should, did not want to. And this is important to Temujin. So we're going to go back in a minute. But, was she 
incorporated into that tribe as a full citizen? And the answer is yes, and her children would be too. So it's more complicated than just they went around raping women. They incorporated them. Was violence and sexual violence part of this incorporation? Yes. It was. Was violence and sexual violence probably... Well, the violence part was. Was the sexual violence part part of the incorporation of children? Probably. People being people? History being history? Probably. And so settled peoples look at this and are horrified by this. So let's go back to Temujin for a second. So Temujin, we can make the argument, the argument can be made that the entire Mongol Empire was built for the love of a woman. See, Temujin was just a regular old guy in a regular old tribe doing regular old stuff. When a Turkish tribe came along, Turkish-speaking tribe came along and wiped his tribe out. There's a battle or a series of battles and he was left for dead. His wife kidnapped, gone. He then spends the next, I don't know how many years, 10 years, 20 years, creating a reputation, becoming part of another tribe, becoming the leader of that tribe, and eventually getting revenge. Uniting other tribes who then make war on the tribe that kidnapped his wife, left him for dead, makes war on that tribe, and murders those people. He gets back his wife. He has fought for a better part of his life to get back his wife, and he does. There's a complication. Temujin has a son. And there's a question of who the father is of that son. Temujin will always claim it's his. He will always claim that that son is his. That said, history also writes down that he had a very ex uh, estranged relationship with that son. And they say, well, why did he have a bad relationship with his eldest son, his natural heir? Maybe because it wasn't actually his heir. Now, you would understand why he would say it's his son. One is, it's his son. He's going to raise him as his son. Because even if it's not his, to say, it's not my son, I reject him, is to reject his wife. And the whole point of this whole thing is, Temujin loved his wife so much, he wanted her back. Two, this is the way things were fought. These are rules of the game. Don't lose. Rule one of history is do not lose. Temujin is one of the few people who lost and later wins. And so to save the reputation of his wife, to say, no, she would never, never take another man as a, as a husband. She's always was loyal to me. Is to, to honor the wife is to accept that son as his. And to say, no, we, son was always mine. There were no witnesses. There's nobody around. They're all dead. And so, for the love of a woman, Genghis Khan will unite the Turkish tribes, wage war to get his wife back, and raise a son who may not be his own for the love of a woman. Not bad. So back to the terrorism. What the Mongols did was obliterate infrastructure. What they simply did was wreck things. Level it. They poisoned the wells. They ripped up the irrigation. Northern China is going to decline in population by 30 million people. Baghdad is destroyed to such an extent there is an economic argument that the Middle East until never recovered, that they still haven't recovered economically from the destruction of the of all of the irrigation. Four thousand years of irrigation ripped up, poisoned. In the twelve forties, they're going to invade Russia 
and obliterate the kingdom of Kiev. And I mean obliterate Kiev. Kiev, 50 years later, was still a smoking ruin. Like something out of Lord of the Rings or out of Dungeons and Dragons. Something you explore. Uh, like the seven cities of gold, like a Mayan temple that's, that's found in the jungle. 50, year, 50 years later, two generations of people. 50 years later, travelers going through Kiev reported that the city, which had been a capital, was still deserted. A city of dogs. Baghdad in 1258 is obliterated. Everything ripped up. The Abbasid Caliphate destroyed. Never, there is not another caliphate. Yeah, the Turks will say they're a caliphate, but they're the Turks. There is not another Arab, Arabic Muslim caliphate going back to Muhammad. Left. Never, never another one again. In fact, that's what ISIS is claiming to be. ISIS is the Islamic State. They're claiming to be the new Abbasids. They're claiming to be the new Rashidun. They're claiming to be 800 years of lost history, that they are the new history. And it turns out not to be. Samarkand, Herat, Merv, the, the, the cities of Afghanistan that were golden, had golden domed mosques obliterated. A million people murdered. Persia, that's as, almost as old as Mesopotamia, just driven through like it was just plowed under. It was better to surrender and never revolt. Areas got poorer when the Mongols came through. That's what they want to do. They picked up people and they sent them to Mongolia. They picked up slaves and sent them to Mongolia. They destroyed things. Why? Why would they destroy cities? Because they don't live in cities. Because when it started, they didn't care. People who live in cities are losers. They're not civilized. They're slaves. They're slaves to their farms. They're slaves to their work. They're not free. Nomadic peoples think settled peoples are rich, fat, and lazy. Settled people look at nomadic peoples and think they are poor, stupid, because they have no, no, nothing, no writing, no schools, or nothing. They're poor, they're stupid, and they're barbaric. They have no rules. They're dirty. They're poor, stupid, and barbaric. So they hate each other. They look at each other and they say, my way of life is better. This is the original division in human history. Settled versus nomadic. And each say, my life is better. Settled people have education. They have food. They have money. But they're tied down. They're stuck in a place. Nomadic peoples can move. They have freedom. But every day, every moment of every day is a war against survival, against death. What do we say to death? Not today. That is what nomadic peoples like the Mongols, like the Huns say. Not today. But that's a life of poverty. It's a life of community because everyone has to share. Whereas settled people have the life of the individual This violence is cooked into. And why commit violence on city people? Because you don't live like that. Temujin, at least the story is of Temujin. It might have been another Mongolian um, leader. Wanted to depopulate northern China. Looked at Jin China and said, let's murder everybody. Let's just kill, kill everybody there. 100 million people. Let's just murder them all and turn northern China which is like the eastern half of the United States, into grassland for horses. It would be better for horses to have fodder than for people to have cities and farms. That's the way they thought. And the story, of uh, when I've heard it, it's Temujin, but it could be, it's apocryphal, it could be any of them. But the story is that 
the Chinese officials had to convince him of what taxes were. Because nomadic peoples don't pay taxes. Because they don't build anything. And so they had to convince him what taxes were and that 30 million, 100 million living Chinese pay a lot more in taxes than dead Chinese. Okay, in our next episode, we're going to talk about effects. How the Mongols affected Korea, Japan, and China. Okay. Thank you.